Well, it isn't often that you meet a couple that has sort of blazed trails in 80 million different ways. So let me introduce to my far left, Dr. Martine Rothblatt and her wife, Bina. Um, and before we get into the science, may we just sort of get all the domestic stuff out of the way? You guys have been married for how many years? 31, almost 32. And when you met? Los Angeles kids who fell in love with each other. And Martine, when you met, you were not Martine. Uh, no. Do you want to explain who you were? Do <laughs> yeah. I have to be Chelsea Handler? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm a transgendered woman. And um, so when we met we were and married, we were um, a heterosexual couple. And, um, but we loved each other's souls. And during the course of our 32 years, we've uh, transitioned into becoming a transgendered couple. And along the course of the way, we've had four children, now four grandchildren, four, uh, three Labradoodles and a Beagle. <laughs> and uh, Bina has about a couple dozen chickens. <laughs> and so, I think so that's the story. Interracial before most people did it, transgender before most people did it, and a marriage that lasts, which people just don't do, period. <laughs> so congratulations, besides being smart. So now we'll get into the science. So um, they're extraordinary people, and I should say that their four children, their fourth child suddenly became male with something called pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is lethal. Now, I have to go to Martine for a second, because there isn't often that someone has published books in the following categories. Satellite communications, gender differences, genetic engineering, organ transplantation, and Middle East peace. <laughs> you should get a Nobel. No, 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 no. <laughs> so she started satellite, Sirius Satellite and sold the Sirius went public. She extricated herself, and to save her child, they created this company. Tell me, one, what it was like to have a child who you realized you were likely going to bury, and then your race to find something to save her. It was very difficult, very, very difficult, especially with four children. You had to, well, I was raised in a family with a stepfather, and I always wanted, um, if I ever was in that position, to treat all my children the same, which I didn't get that feeling growing up. So. Um, with our children, I had to decide to treat them all the same, even though one was very ill. And as your baby, your youngest, with a lethal illness, did you every day think this might be the last? It was pretty shocking when they said she needed a heart-lung transplant at six years old. And we couldn't get that because uh, it was experimental medicine for children. And they just wouldn't pay for it. And classically, I mean, or classified as an orphan disease. So there's really no federal funding. And, and the, it's not like the pharmaceutical companies are lining up to fund orphan drugs. That's right. But Martin, that didn't stop you. No, Nancy. I mean, the first thing that we did is we took uh, Genesis, our daughter, to as many experts as we could find. They all said the same thing. There's no FDA-approved medicines for this drug. Um, she will be dead within two to three years unless she receives a heart-lung transplant. Then we, uh, we had known that wealthy people will create foundations and give out money to doctors who, who um, promise cures. So we wrote a request for proposals, which is the kind of thing I knew how to do from the satellite communications industry. We sent that out to all of the doctors researching this area, promised them hundreds of thousands of dollars a year if they could show progress towards And at that time, there were only 75 doctors only so 75, in the country, that's right? correct. Who even knew what this illness was. And, um, but um, after a couple years of that, by this time, Genesis was in the intensive care ward at Children's National Hospital here in uh, Washington, more than she was out of it. Um, and there was no, people took our money, but the cure got no closer. Um, so then one of the doctors said to me, Martine, uh, you and Bean have made a big splash. We all appreciate your money, but none of this is going to save Genesis. There is a medicine at uh, Burl's Welcome, which became Glaxo Welcome, which they are not going to develop because the market is not a billion dollar market for this small orphan disease that just affects a few thousand women in the U.S. and a few men. Um, maybe you could use your skills as a satellite CEO to get this medicine out of Glaxo and develop it. And I looked at her uh, like she was crazy. 
Like, just because you can launch satellites, that doesn't mean that you know anything at all about medicine, which I didn't. I didn't even take biology in college. But um, when your daughter's facing death, you're willing to leap a 30-foot high wall. So I parachuted in there. I found my way through the Glaxo bureaucracy. I got to the right person. Through a lot of persistence and a couple of lucky breaks, we were able to outlicense this um, drug, which at that time was so little they had made of it, it wouldn't even fill a thimble. It wouldn't save one person. It was made by a process that was uh, unrealistic for large-scale medical production. It was not approved by the FDA. There was no actual way we could actually give this to our daughter. But th from that little tiny, tiny seed of a seed of a seed, we had the vision between our love for each other and our love for Genesis to um, build a team, hire staff, um, hire lab space, develop a drug, find a way to manufacture it that nobody thought existed, find a way to deliver it that nobody thought was possible. And the FDA um, approved it in 2002 just as uh, Genesis was really pretty much gasping on, on her last breath. And thankfully, uh, today, Genesis is in college, is uh, living happily. <laughs> She's a, uh, a delightful uh, young lady. There's little snippets of her on the web here and there. She actually, at, at the same you hope time- not too much Facebook? Well, there was, there was a little bit. Uh, she's a great, uh, she actually has been normalized in her health so much that she's an amazing uh, tango and salsa dancer, and you can see cool. a YouTube or two of that. But um, the most exciting thing to me is that she decided to go back to school and study biochemistry while at the same time working at our company, being in charge of all of the virtual spaces and the video walls in our company's offices to motivate people to help find a cure for everybody else. You had a creative way, because there was a cap on how much you could charge for people over a lifetime of drugs, but you figured out a sneaky way to get around the pricing. Exactly, Nancy. Big pharmaceutical companies didn't want to develop orphan drugs because they thought they could charge maybe a few thousand dollars a year, and you multiply that times a few thousand people, and it will never make a difference to a pharmaceutical company. I looked at our own health insurance contract, and I saw that there was no price cap that they would pay for any particular drug. Although before the Affordable Care Act, there was a lifetime maximum for most health care policies. So we went ahead and, if you will, had the chutzpah to say, why don't we go ahead and charge $100,000 a, a year per patient for this medicine when no other drug had charged that amount? And if anybody cannot pay for it, and in fact, if anybody is within $300,000 of their lifetime cap, we'll just give the medicine to them for free. And we did that, $300,000, because that's about the cost of a heart-lung transplant, which is the last stage uh, treatment if all other medicines fail. Now, several uh, years later, we followed this policy for all of our medicines. We have three medicines approved by the FDA. We have a billion dollars a year in sales. We have always given all of our medicines totally free to anybody in the U.S., including undocumented Americans, documented Americans. If you're in the U.S., you get our medicine for free. If you can't pay for it or if, you, if you're even within 300000 of your lifetime cap, Affordable Care Act gets rid of that af affordable right. that cap. Thank you, President Obama. And it's interesting that despite that policy, um, the company has always been very profitable. Um, I should say, so the stock is up 800% since 1999. So That's you can not do a bad the right thing and the good thing and the, and the profitable thing. To me, they all melt together. And all of these profits we are recycling into our latest project, which is creating an unlimited supply of organs for transplantation so nobody ever again has to face the triage of dying on the transplant list. Bina, I want to talk to you for a second about relationships because having a sick child can break a relationship more times than not. But for you guys, it seems to have made you stronger. I'd like to know why and how and the effect on the other three kids. Well, we just wouldn't give up. Um, Genesis uh, had a bedroom upstairs, so by 6 o'clock every evening, we'd have to carry her upstairs because she just couldn't, she couldn't, she didn't have enough breath to make it up the stairs anymore. So we all just, you know, had fun doing it, just I'm gonna carry Jenny upstairs and finally we moved her bedroom downstairs. She wasn't getting heavy or anything, it just, it made it better. She wanted to be a part of everybody else. She wanted to be a part of what they're doing all the time and she couldn't. I had to stay at home to give her medicine every four hours or every eight hours, go take it to school. Well, um, I wouldn't let it affect the other kids. 
if they had lessons, we'd have to be there. If, um, the only time it affected them actually is when she would faint or something like that while we're doing something. So what we did is we um, took Genesis and Gabriel, our other younger one, um, out of school and we did homeschooling. And we decided that if this was gonna be it, we're gonna go around the world with our kids. So <laughs> we went around the world with our two younger kids and in the meantime, every place we went, we had them do reports and all the other things. And our older two children were already in college. So it, um, we have a special thing on Friday nights where everybody has to be home. And uh, we have a little um, kind of family ceremony. It's kind of called Love Night. So every Friday night we get together. And um, I converted to Judaism over 30 something years ago. And uh, so we light the candles. We do, you know, we sing for the challah. We do all these things. And then we talk about, each person gets a chance to talk about what love means to them. Mm -hmm. And it just brought us really close. They're an together. extraordinary couple, a really extraordinary couple. Nancy, um, one of the things that has outgrown from that, which is to me really, really beautiful, is you talk about the other kids. Um, Genesis's older brother, um, about a year ago, decided out of the blue that he was going to run for Congress in the uh, Eighth District of Florida. <laughs> and um, at this time, when Congress is so dysfunctional, and so many people would maybe think, "Well, I don't want to have put anything to do in with if it." I do better. Yeah, he said, you know, this is the time when it's most important for us young people to step up to the plate and to do something. He's got a beautiful progressive platform. It seems to us, even on his website, he says how it's been informed by the adventure with Genesis and being in my life and the different battles. And he's just trying to extend those battles to the future. And it, it makes me really remember what was said in an earlier speaker, um, how out of the you know, harshness of life sometimes you can learn very empowering lessons. I want to talk for a second about something called xenotransplantation, which is animal to human transplantation, not okay by the FDA. You believe in pig to human transplantation. Why? Well, because what I believe is that it's possible with the techniques of genetic engineering to modify um, enough of the genes in the pig genome so that when that um, um, pig organ is placed into a person, that the body will react to it no more harshly than it would react to an organ transplanted from another person. Because the concern has been that there might be animal viruses that you'd be putting in a human. Actually, that concern was pretty much quashed about quashed. a decade ago. So it's a rejection issue. It's a purely a rejection issue and a coagulation issue. The, the fear of what was called, I don't want to get too technical, but porcine endogenous yeah. retroviruses, that was shown not to be a fear whatsoever. So then what's the issue if there are lots of pigs and not enough organs to block the science, which has been proven to be okay? Well, what we've done is we just crossed one year that we have successfully put one of our genetically engineered hearts into a baboon model. So what the FDA wants you to show is that you can place your, your genetically engineered porcine organ into an animal model, which the baboon is the standard animal model for a year, that this can be done with a series of them, say a couple dozen, and that during this period of time, the animal is safe. Nobody wants to repeat the baby Fay experiments right. of the 1980s. So we are organ by organ, step by step, modifying our genome. We have all of the US team in our company that did Dolly the Pig, Dolly the Sheep back in the 1990s at the Roslyn Institute. In fact, right now, we've got about 700 employees in our company. And I say, in a way, we have like 800 because 100 of them are pigs. <laughs> <laughs> so for those in the audience who might be squeamish about animal research or um, you know, that step in getting drugs approved or organ transplantation moved forward, what would your answer be? Well, my first answer is that the, it's absolutely been essential for us from the beginning to treat all of the animals involved in our research with respect. And uh, any sentient being, whether they be a person, an animal, or even in the near future, cyber conscious beings, needs to be treated with the respect that they can appreciate. So you just touched on something that Ginny talked about earlier, and that is cyber conscious, because Ginny Romney earlier today was talking about robots. Is there a robot named after you? Yes, there is. <laughs> Do I know of that robot in Vermont? The robots in Vermont. Yes. Vina 48. So what's the future of robots, and why, although I get, sort of get satellites to pharmaceuticals to robots, is that the future? I mean, you guys, it's not a normal pathway. <laughs> is, do you think there's, that's, that's a phenomenal? I mean, Ginny really thinks that's an important future in medicine and technology and even humanity. Do you think that's true? It's true. We're, I want everybody to get their mind file uploaded into one of our websites that we have out there for our um, 
lifenaw.com or cyberev.com so they can also put themselves into a computer model that I have, a little bust of me, and it runs around talking to people and it answers a lot of Does questions. Does everyone become an African-American woman? Is that <laughs> <laughs> But you can be whoever you want. Yeah. That's the exciting <laughs> part. I think it'd be and, okay to be you. Oh my gosh, it's so cool because this little, this little half of me, it learns everything. It's got German, it just <laughs> speaks German. I love it. I can't wait to learn more, but it's there's, still got my personality. <laughs> but there's some, there's some extraordinary companion science about the fact that people accept robots right. as companions in hospitals and in homes and increasingly techno technologically as we put mm -hmm. minds and feeling into robots, there might be an extraordinary future there. I think so. Your views? I think that um, what we call mind cloning is totally different from the other type of body cloning and as Bina described, when you can upload your mannerisms, personality, recollections, and feelings, this happens automatically every time we update our posts on Facebook with Facebook timeline, every time we tweet um, with Google Glass, with wearable computers, our entire lives are gonna be streaming and stored on cloud servers. So did you guys know when you first met each other how smart you both were? I knew how smart Bina was. I knew how smart Bina was immediately. I knew how goal-oriented you were, and right. I knew. <laughs> stick with you. Did you ever in your life really think, as a science geek, you would figure out serious radio, go to start a pharmaceutical company that brings in a billion dollars, and oh, by the way, create robots in Vermont, and oh yeah, all those kids and animals? I, I didn't. I thought that I would be able to launch satellites, and um, I still, um, I'm such a huge fan and, and supporter of all the things that are being done by SpaceX and uh, Orbital Sciences in terms of private space enterprise. I'm absolutely convinced, as I know Bean is too, that the destiny of humanity is amongst the stars. And I think that the, the most important part of our journey into robots and into space is our humanity, is well, to I take our the, humanity. I think the destiny of humanity has to do with more people like you guys. Congratulations. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.